Welcome to this week's Rajabian program. We've had a great season so far. We've had Ali Master, we've had Nancy Ashley, we've had Tracy Walder, uh, we've had Dana Harkey, and now we're having Mary Robertson. Uh, she's new to Rajabian, but you will find that she is a compelling speaker. Uh, tonight's topic is Benjamin Franklin, the founding father who winked at history. Can't think of an American that was more accomplished than Ben Franklin. And uh, Mary Robertson tells a compelling tale. So let me introduce her. Mary Robertson is a retired Plato Independent School District librarian. She's been a member of the Richland College adjunct faculty since 2004. Currently, she's a lecturer in the Emeritus program. Since retiring from the school district, she has had some amazing experiences while volunteering for both disaster relief and for the National Park Service. Uh, Mary is probably the only person you know that ever worked as part of a four-person team to dismantle, move, and reassemble a Civil War era mountain cannon. Mary was a wheel person. She also helped write and acted in historical skits as part of the Living History programs at Fort Spokane, Washington. Mary's love of history and travel combined for wonderful adventures to historical sites. She's visited every state in the United States as well as many international destinations over five continents. Mary is the mother of three grown sons, Nana to eight grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. Uh, we're excited to present to you Mary Robertson, a very extraordinary great-grandmother. Good afternoon. Have you ever found a book that you enjoyed reading so much that when you got to the end of it, you really needed to read more? Sometimes I feel like Paul Harvey, I want the rest of the story. And that was the case with Walter Isaacson's book, Benjamin Franklin, An American Life. Mr. Isaacson is an amazing researcher, and there's over 50 pages of his notes in the back of this book. So you think you would cover everything, but one thing that he references in this book over and over is the autobiography that Ben Franklin himself wrote. So I had to go out and get it. It's much shorter and easier to read, by the way. But the thing that is amazing when I look at the two books, Isaacson is working, looking back at a life well lived. He is trying to give a sense of the activities and the contributions of this man. Ben Franklin has a totally different goal. He is writing this book for his children and he wants to show his life, of course, in a good image, but he also wants his children to learn from his mistakes. So I recommend both of those books and they were both sources in our talk today. I want to start with Ben Franklin's birthplace because he is unusual among our founding fathers. He was the 15th child of 17 in the family of Josiah Franklin. His, Josiah's first wife had seven of the children before she died, and then Ben's mother, Abaya, had the next 10. Now, there's something you need to remember about this time in our history. The oldest son inherits everything. So if you're not the oldest son, you're going to have to make your own way. And as it turns out, Josiah was the last son of a last son of a last son of a last son for about seven generations. So everybody in his ancestry, his close ancestry, had had to earn their own way. And in trying to be certain that Ben is going to be able to have, be successful in life and take care of his two younger sisters, uh, he's going to educate him. There's only one time, by the way, that uh, Franklin's family is all together. Uh, and that was when his brother came home from being at sea for 10 years. And they brought all the family together. The amazing thing is the age range was from 3 to 39. And he says that's the only time he remembers seeing him at the same time. Now, in trying to educate Ben, his father is going to send him to the Boston Grammar School for one year, at the age of eight, he loved the Boston Grammar School. He loved the learning to read, the literature, writing. It was all just exactly what that young mind was looking for. But after that first year, his father couldn't afford that school anymore, and he moved him to Mr. Brownwell's school, which stressed writing and arithmetic. Well, writing he still loved, but the arithmetic not so much. 
And after one year, he left there to work in his father's candle making shop. Two years of formal education is all Ben Franklin had. And it's amazing when he's referred to often as Dr. Franklin, and that's because of the honorary degrees he received from Yale, Harvard, and Oxford. He felt education was so important that in 1749, he convinced the citizens of Pennsylvania that they needed a state school, and that's now known as the University of Pennsylvania. Now, I said he worked in his father's candle-making shop. When we think of candles, we kind of think of those nice smelling ones that we use today. That's not the kind of candles his father was making. These were just plain utilitarian candles and they didn't smell good. In fact, when you're working with that tallow, it stinks. And young Ben did not like that at all. There were a number of things about candle making that he did not see him doing that for his whole life. So his father, being the, the kind of person he was, was looking for a career for him. And he decided that his love of reading and writing, that being a printer would be the perfect thing. And would you believe it? He had a big brother who was already a successful printer. Now, he is going to apprentice Ben to Jim, uh, James at the age of 12. Think about your children and grandchildren at 12. Are they ready to sign a binding contract that will keep them working for free until they are 21. Now, some of the other things he had to agree to in that contract is that he could not get married, he could not play cards, he could not drink alcohol, or attend the theater. I mean, that's a long list to ask a 12-year-old to sign. Now, in return for that, James is going to teach him how to be a printer and provide him with food, clothing, and shelter and a new suit on his 21st birthday. The, uh, and Ben took to the print business right away. He really enjoyed the work. He enjoyed helping read, edit the paper. Now, James had the New England Current, and one of the things that he offered his readers was a chance to write in, and he would publish stories or, or debates or whatever the person was interested in. Well, Ben thought he had some wonderful ideas for James, but James said, you're just a kid. I'm not going to print anything you write. So Ben, being the kind of young person he was and wanting to show his brother that he could write as well as anybody, started writing under the name of Silence Do Good. Now, I want you to think about this. He's about 14 years old at this point, and he is going to be writing as a widow lady in rural Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. He's going to sneak the letters under the door so that his brother has no idea that they come from him. Well, under Silence Do Good's name, he wrote some fascinating letters. He wrote about everything, politics, finance, and he, she starts at the beginning, her first letter, where she introduces herself, telling about her life. And one of the things she says is that her parents came from England to the United States on ship, and during that voyage, she is born. And her father is so excited. They've delivered a, happy, a healthy baby. His wife's okay. He goes up on deck to celebrate, tell everybody about the wonderful news. Silence has been born. And a wave hits the ship, and he falls overboard and dies. So on the day of her birth, her mother becomes a parent and a widow. It's such a sad story. Now, remember, he's making all this up. Nobody fell overboard. The... Uh, Further on, she is asked to, to write some, she's had a question and, about marriage, and she tries to explain her situation. And I'll quote from his letter. I have now remained in a state of widowhood for several years, but it is a state I have never much admired, and I'm apt to fancy that I could be easily persuaded to marry again, provided that I was sure of a good-humored, sober, agreeable companion, but one with even these few good qualities being hard to find, I have lately relinquished all thoughts of that nature. Now remember, this is about a 14-year-old, 15-year-old boy writing this at this point. Uh, 
everything went fine for a long time. There were a long series of letters that he even featured on the first page on some occasions. The readers loved the letters. And then one night, James caught him sliding the letter under the door. And that did not go over well because not only had Ben fooled his readers, he had fooled James and that was embarrassing to him. Their relationship got a little stressed at that point. James was arrested and jailed for writing a critical article about a sermon that a religious leader in, in Boston had given. You do not criticize sermons at that time period. You can get thrown in jail for that. And that's exactly what happened to James. And not only was he thrown in jail, he was forbidden to run his paper. He had to shut it down or turn it over to someone else. Well, by this point, Ben is about 17 years old. He has really learned the business well. And so James convinces the court that Ben can run the paper. Now, the court knows that he's a prentice, so they say only if he, if he is a free man. So they tear up that apprenticeship agreement so that Ben can, can run the paper. Now, you know good and well, that was for show. In the reality, they tore up that agreement and he had Ben sign another agreement so that Ben was no longer free. But that's okay, the court didn't know about that other agreement. And while James was in jail, Ben ran the paper. It was very successful and very prosperous. That presented some strain when James got out of, of prison. And at this point, James is going to be very critical of Ben because he's a little embarrassed that at 17 he was able to be as profitable as he was with the paper. All of a sudden, Ben realizes, wait a minute, I don't have to put up with that. If I run away, he can't come get me because if he enforces that second agreement I signed, the courts will know that he lied and did not release me from the contract. So when the situation got to a point where Ben didn't think he could stand it any longer, he ran away. He first went to New York City thinking he'd get a job there, but there weren't any jobs at that point that were what he needed. And somebody said, well, get back on the boat, head on down to Philadelphia. I know they are looking for printers down there. So he did. And when he got to Philadelphia, he basically had the clothes on his back. He had left things in New York that would be sent later when he found a place to live. So he gets off the boat and he has money enough to buy two loaves of bread. One he buys for himself and one he buys for a, a lady, a widow lady with children that had no money to buy food for them. So the picture that's on the screen now is from a description in his autobiography of the first time his future wife will see him. And that's Deborah Reed standing in the door. And he describes himself as walking down the street with a loaf of bread sticking out of one pocket and his laundry sticking out of the other pocket. Deborah didn't think too much of that young man at that point. But it turns out that her family run a boarding house and that will end up being where he boards once he gets a job and gets settled. Now, he is, is amazed that Governor William Keith of Pennsylvania takes a shine to him and he thinks that the two of them could work together and he wants to send Ben to London to buy equipment and to learn some new skills that use that equipment. And he tells Ben that he will pay for his round trip to London. He will give him letters of credit so that when he gets there, he can draw money from the bank and letters of reference. He can get the equipment trained and he should be back in a couple of months. So Ben is so excited about his prospects that he proposes to Deborah. Now there's, she's younger than he is and he's 17. Her mother, remembering the image of him the first time they saw him, uh, does not see any great future in Ben. And so she refuses to let them marry. But that's okay, they promise to, to when he comes back, they will marry, thinking he's gonna be gone for a couple of months. Unfortunately, Governor Keith wasn't quite as, as uh, well, truthful is a good word for it, because when Ben got to London, there were no letters of credit, there were no letters of introduction, there was nothing. He didn't even have a round-trip ticket. So first thing he has to do is 
job, and he's fortunate to get a job working in Palmer's Printer House, which is one of the premier printing houses in London. But it takes him two years before he can earn enough money to buy the equipment that he now wants to start his own business and to buy his ticket back. But he is really looking forward to getting back and Deborah, except in the two years he's gone, Deborah is married. Now, there's more to that story and we'll get to it in a minute. But when he gets back, he does begin to work in Philadelphia and he realizes two things. His two years of formal education does not give him the kind of expertise that he needs to be a leader in his community. And he really wants to be a contributing citizen in the community. So he comes up with this idea that he would get 10 friends, clever acquaintances, all well read, and they would meet once a week and they would learn new skills, they would discuss politics, religion, all of the topics that he has very limited education on. And they call themselves the Junta, and they start this philosophical group when he's 21. Now, these young men are going to become leaders in Philadelphia. They're going to influence all kinds of public projects. Subscription libraries was one that was to their benefit as well as the communities because one person could buy the book and then they would circulate it among the whole group and they could all then discuss it. So the subscription library was one of their first things. The volunteer fire department was another. This group lasted for 40 years and Ben considered it one of the best schools of philosophy, morality, and politics that ever existed in the province. And it was so popular that other people wanted to join. Ben did not want the group to get bigger than 10 because that would affect the discussions and the interaction that they were able to have. So what they did was each member could go start another group and they all kept the groups down to the size of 10. Oh, by the way, did I mention that they met in the pubs every week? It was a really good group for all purposes. But another thing that Ben did to try to improve his status in the community and his, his reputation was he made a list of virtues and he felt like if he practiced one virtue for one month, that virtue would then become a habit and then he would work on the next and the next. And those virtues had a great range. They started with temperance, silence, order, resolution, frugality, industry, sincerity, justice, moderation, cleanliness, tranquility, chastity, and number 13 is humility. Now, if he's accomplished the first 12, humility is going to be a problem. And he writes in his autobiography, I could not boast of having accomplished humility, but I've made a good stab at putting up appearances. And he had a reputation for being a very dependable person with a high work ethic. Now, he also understood that just to work hard was not enough. If, it, if you made it look too easy, people would not respect you. But if you were seen to work really hard, they respected you more. So every morning, he would take his wheelbarrow and walk through the streets of Philadelphia to get to his supplier, get his paper and, and things he needed for work. And then he would take a different route back to his shop so that all throughout Philadelphia, they would comment on that young Ben working so hard every morning. And he was quite successful. In 1728, he sets up his print shop on High Street. In 29, he publishes the first edition of the Pennsylvania Gazette. In 30, he begins printing money for the colony of Pennsylvania. That is huge in his progress in establishing himself as a leader in the community and in enriching himself because that's a contract that guarantees a cash flow. And in 1736, he begins to print counterfeit proof money for the colony of New Jersey. All of this is going to begin to make his reputation in the community and it's going to guarantee that he is going to have a comfortable living. By the way, when he marries, they live above the shop for a while. Now, I want to get back to this marriage to Deborah. It is a common law marriage. And I used to wonder why in the world someone who was so concerned about the respect of the community 
would be willing to do a common law marriage rather than a marriage within the church. And the reason is Deborah had been married before. The problem with that first marriage was he was a real jerk. He was abusive physically and mentally. He would disappear for long periods of time. She had no idea wh whether he was coming back or not. And the last time she had heard from him, he had boarded a ship to Barbados. And they had gotten word that before the ship reached Barbados, it sunk and everybody on board had died. But she had no proof of that. And without proof of that, they ran the risk that if he didn't die, if he was rescued, and at some point years down the road he came back, they would have committed bigamy. And that, that particular time, bigamy was considered a major crime, and the punishment was 20 lashes and death. Now, I don't know which one they feared more, the 20 lashes of the death, but neither Ben nor Deborah wanted to take a chance on the jerk showing up again. And so they entered into this common law contract of marriage. That way, if he came back, they, were, they had not violated the rules of the church. She would also raise his stepson, William. Oh, wait, he was born in 1730. That was one of the reasons that they married at the time they did. She had agreed that she would raise William for him as, as a member of their family. All we know about William's mother is that Ben did not think that she was suitable to raise his son, and he asked Deborah if she would do that, and that is exactly what happened. They will have two children of their own. Their first child, a son, Francis Folger, is born in 30, uh, 1732. The sad thing about Francis is that he's going to die from smallpox in 1736 at the age of four. Now, the thing about that is Ben wanted to vaccinate the child against smallpox. It was done in the colonies then. The problem is some of the children got very sick and Deborah was terrified of vaccinating the child. She was afraid that he would get the disease and die, and she refused to let Ben vaccinate him. This is going to create a strain on their marriage because that child was the apple of his eye, and if he had only insisted and vaccinated him, would he have lived to be an adult? We'll never know, but it was a great tragedy in Ben's life, and it changed his opinion about many things. They later had a daughter, Sarah, who they called Sally, who was born in, in 43. Sarah and her mother are going to be very close all her life. She's not going to have that relationship with Ben because of the amount of time that he's traveling in Europe. But when he returns to the United, uh, to the United States by that point, uh, toward the end of his life, Sarah's family is living in Ben's mansion, and he is she will be caring for him the rest of his life and their relationship becomes very, very close. One of the things uh, about his marriage with Deborah, she never travels to Europe with him. All the years that he spends in Europe, Deborah never goes. And that's because she is terrified of water. And no matter how he approached the subject, she was not willing to get on a ship and be in the ocean surrounded by water for that length of time. Uh, that was a, not an unusual reaction of women of colonial time. There were many of the men that would travel back and forth, but the women rarely made more than one voyage. By 1733, Ben is going to add a new item to his print shop, and it's his almanac. He calls it Poor Richard's Almanac. And he, there were already three um, or two almanacs in Philadelphia, so this is the third one. And people questioned whether there was a need for another one, but he would sell over 10,000 copies a year. So that's another great cash flow for him at this point. And almanacs were very popular. They were second only to the Bible in circulation in English colonies at that time. They gave forecasts for the weather for the whole year. They had poems and stories and anecdotes, astrological information, all kinds of details on planting crops and harvesting crops. And to this day, there are people in New England that buy the farmer's almanac to plan their social calendar. And if it says in the almanac it's gonna rain on that Saturday, they don't schedule a party on that Saturday. It is that popular in that area to this day. 
And uh, when, in answer to do we need a third almanac for Philadelphia, Ben, of course, remember he still has the paper, the Pennsylvania cassette. And so on the, the just before he releases the album, for, uh, the almanac for sale, he publishes the obituary of the publisher of one of the other two almanacs. So people think that the man has died, so his almanac will probably not be there, and they go ahead and buy one of Ben's. Of course, the man was outraged, and he published in uh, rebuttal in all of the papers that he could. I am not alive, regardless of what Mr. Frank, I'm not dead, regardless of what Mr. Franklin says. The, uh, one of the things is that he would do in the almanac to fill spaces, if he had a little bit of space, that, but not enough for a story, he would print uh, just a little comment, a quote, that people seem to really enjoy. And I'm not going to use all of them, but there's some that I really like that are not as popular or not as well known. Uh, many people die at 25 and aren't buried until they're 75. Three may keep a secret if two of them are dead. There never was a good war or a bad peace. Better slip with your foot than tongue. Now, these are three that you don't hear very often, and I'll save the best for last. Uh, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. In wine, there is wisdom. In beer, there is freedom. In water, there is bacteria. And my favorite, we are all born ignorant but one must work hard to remain stupid. Duh. Now, he's had many contacts with public, printing money for uh, the different colonies, and in 1734, he is going to be pro, uh, appointed co-royal postmaster general for the crown. Now, the thing about this, there, it's typically a co appointment so that they're because at that time the colonies are spread out enough you need more people but he is going to change the way the postal system is run he's going to improve to the point that he could get a letter from Philadelphia to New York City in about the same time it takes today sometimes even faster than that but I want you to notice it's the royal postmaster so this is while they are loyal to to England and it stops abruptly in 1774, and that's because he's become very in involved in the independence movement. And in fact, when the Second Continental Congress is getting the, the country organized, he will be the first United States Postmaster General, and that starts in 1775. So it, there are many places where the post office has honored him with uh, stamps during, since that time period. This is his first formal portrait. He's about 32, it's about 1738. Now there are a couple of things I want you to think about on this portrait. Number one, the 15th child of a candle maker is rarely rich enough to afford a portrait. But he has been so successful in his printing business that in fact he is wealthy. They no longer live over the print shop. He has built a mansion for Deborah and Sarah there in Philadelphia. And he is going to become clerk of the Pennsylvania Assembly, so he's beginning to get a reputation and contributions in politics. And so at the age of 42, Ben does something most unusual. He retires from working as a printer so that he now has the freedom and the time to work on his experiments, to work on, on contributions to the community and to the new country that they are going to build. Now, he has had a partner that has worked with him all along, and, and David Hall is going to continue to run the business. But there is another source of income after he retires. Remember when he was apprenticed and learned the skill? Well, all of this time, he has been apprenticing other young men and as they finish their apprenticeship and need to be set up in business, he makes a contract with them. He will provide the supplies and the equipment, they supply the labor, and they split the profits. Today, we kind of call that franchising. 
So there are two things that you didn't normally see in this time period, retirement and franchising, that are going to make it possible for him to have the wealth that is needed for him to become so involved in birthing our country. One of the things that makes him so successful in that role is his scientific experiments and his correspondence with other scientists in Europe. So that by the time he has retired, he already has a reputation for being a thinker and a uh, very clever, astute person in Europe as well as in the colonies. Now, we know about electricity. He did not discover electricity, nor was he the only one trying to do kite experiments. They were trying to prove there was electricity in lightning and to find ways to, to make lightning more safer. And one of the ways that came up that he developed was the lightning rod, which would take the lightning strike and ground it. Because at that time, houses were built out of wood. And if the one roof was hit, you could lose a whole section of the community. This picture, I think, is interesting because that's supposed to be William that is helping his father with his kite experiment. But uh, William was a grown man at this time, so the artist had taken a little liberties making William a young boy. But one of the things about Ben that's not well known is that he did not patent any of his inventions. He felt that they were for the good of, the, of his community. And so the lightning rod particularly was quickly dispensed throughout the colonies so that it prevented a lot of fires. Some of the other things that we really benefited from, uh, bifocals is one that's very important to me. And until he came up with the idea of putting the two lenses together, he had to keep changing uh, glasses. So I'm glad that he had the problem so that he could work out a solution. The Franklin stove was another major safety factor because for several reasons. One, it dispersed heat through the room better than a fireplace, but the the fire itself was in an enclosed area. It had a shield around it, so there were less chances of catching your clothes on fire or coals running out and setting the house on fire. And it was a very efficient uh, invention. But his favorite invention is one that I've never been able to hear, and I understand from reading that they are were wonderful instruments. He, developed, he invented the harmonica. I'm sure you've seen people that play the water glasses where they put different amounts of water in each glass and pull their finger around the top and it makes a note. Well, he thought that was cumbersome. And if you knock the glass over, it could ruin your performance. So he had a glass blower blow bowls from large to small and place them on a rod. That rod is connected to a pedal which he could push with his foot and it would turn the bowls. And then he dipped his finger in water and would hold his finger against the rim of each of the bowls. And it made a beautiful sound. They became so popular, there were concerts in Europe with symphony orchestras. And he and Sarah played together many times on the harmonica. So this was his fun invention. And he, it was his, considered his favorite. But there's some things I doubt that you have heard on his inventions. He did not invent or discover electricity, but he improved batteries. He built improved electric generators. He identified positive and negative terminology. He identified insulators and conductors, which made research on electricity safer. He also investigated and mapped what is now known as the Gulf Stream. Now, he wasn't the first to notice that, that at certain points in crossing the Atlantic, you went through warmer waters and, and it, it changed the climate as you passed through them. But he and one of the captains that he traveled with actually tested the temperatures of the water and mapped how the Gulf Stream moved through there. He improved catheters. He made a flexible design. You remember that big brother, James, that was kind of cruel to him at the end there? 
James got very sick and he was, he was dying actually. He required catheters daily and Ben designed the flexible catheter so that it could relieve some of James' uh, pain. The other thing that he did for James, James had a son, but he wasn't old enough to take over his printing business. He was still needed to be trained. And James asked Ben if he would take this son and take care of his wife and son until the son could be trained and old enough to run the business. And Ben did that for him so that that relationship had been healed. He developed swim fins, and this is another one of his fun things because he loved to swim, but he wasn't as fast as some people, and he wanted to be faster. So he looked at fish and he thought, that's the design I need, and he developed those. He also invented the long arm that we use for reaching things on top shelves. There are a lot of us that appreciate that invention. And he came up with a phonetic alphabet that he thought would solve the problem of poor spelling. Uh, the problem was none of his friends understood it well enough, so when he wrote them using the phonetic alphabet and sent them the alphabet to translate, it was, he, they couldn't do it. So he gave up on the phonetic alphabet. Now you're going to begin to see him get more involved in the, the uh, politics and running the government in the colonies. And he's going to print one of the first political cartoons. And his join, free, join or Die was designed to get the colonies to work together with England in fighting the French and Indian War. And uh, each of the segments of that disconnected snake represents one of the colonies. He also used that same idea in the Albany plan, trying to get representatives from the colonies to come together and work as a unit, not as 13 separate colonies. Funny thing, the representatives all agreed that was a great idea, but when they took it back to their colonies, nobody would agree to it. So he is going to go ahead and organize the regiment for Philadelphia, and he and William will be involved in that regiment that will be assigned building a line of forts to protect Pennsylvania. So he has military experience that we don't think of for Ben. After that war, as you know, we had increasing problems with England trying to pray for, pay for the war. And so they're going to send Ben to England to try to work out some of those disagreements. Remember, they are not trying to separate at this point. They are trying to be loyal English citizens. That doesn't work out well for them. And in 1765, when they passed the Stamp Act, the people in Philadelphia are so mad at Ben for not preventing that act that they riot and encircle the mansion, scares poor Deborah. Something amazing that the citizens of his hometown would turn against him. Interestingly enough, when his testimony to repeal the Stamp Act is published in the colonies, he's suddenly a hero and Sarah is able to rest in peace again. The, after a period of time in England, he's going to return home and he is going to be involved on the committee that writes the Declaration of Independence. At 70, he is much older than the other two that are going to be the principal writers. Jefferson specifically is going to be the principal writer because Adams and Franklin both agree they have to have the, the acceptance by the southern colonies in order for it to succeed and they doubt they could get it if either of them were the author. After they declare their independence, he sent back to Europe to try to uh, represent them to try to get assistance from European countries in this fight. And one of the images you see over and over at this period is him with that, that skin cap. That hat is one that he wore on a trip to Montreal. He's trying to get the support of the Canadians at this point. And son William is going to alert the British about this mission and they will send troops and stop Ben. So at that point, there is no coordination between Canada and the, what become the United States. Now, this is the break in the relationship between the two. At this point, William is the royal governor of New Hampshire, and in spite of Ben's telling him he needs to resign that position and work with the independence movement, he refuses to. He will pay a high price for it. At the end of the war, he spends some time in prison and then returns to England penniless 
and the father and son make several attempts to, to reunite, but they all fail. Uh, while he is in Europe, one of the things he accomplishes is the Treaty of Alliance with France. I want you to think about this. We call Washington the father of our country. It should be Franklin because he is the only founding father that signs all four of the documents necessary to birth this country. The Declaration of Independence, the Treaty of Alliance, then the Treaty of Paris that ends the war, and the U.S. Constitution. While he is in France working on uh, that Treaty of Paris, he is very prominent in the court of France. He, in, he loves the social side of the uh, diplomacy. The Adams family thought that he was just playing around and they could not understand why he, did, he spent so much time socializing. Franklin's belief was that if he became friends with the different people and the different groups that had influence within the French government, then when they were negotiating with the government, they had support from French citizens and they could achieve their goal. And so uh, that may be another word that we could attach to Franklin that you don't usually hear, networking. And he did a lot of networking. He particularly liked the, the salons that the women in, in Paris had to discuss politics. After the end of the war, he returns back to the United States and he will be involved in drafting the Constitution. He's the oldest member at 81. Now, I want you to think just a second. If you've never been to Philadelphia in the summer, I'll promise you, it is hot and it is humid and it is not air conditioned in Independence Hall. Add to that the fact that they feel the need to close the windows and the curtains so that everything that's discussed in the hall is kept within the members until they work out all the details. It was very difficult assignment for an 81-year-old man, but he was incredibly good at helping them to work out the compromises that were necessary to achieve that Constitution. After the Revolutionary War, there are many people in this country that are going to change their idea of slavery. Recently you've heard that Ben was a slave owner and profited from slave trades. I'm only going to spend a minute, but I want you to have an a, a idea of how he worked through the process of slavery or the, the institution of slavery from early in his life to the end of his life. He did own slaves. I found the name of six slaves, including one family of three, that he owned at various times in his life. Uh, the three, the family, usually stayed in Philadelphia with Deborah. Sometimes one of the other men would stay there to help run the house and, and to take care of, of things for Deborah and Sally. Um, two of them often traveled with him when he was in Europe. His Pennsylvania Gazette did publish ads for slave sales. He also published in the same editions ads from the Quaker organization on trying to push for the abolishment of slavery. So his involvement in, in the slave trade was in publishing those ads. He did not actively trade slaves, but he did publish ads in the Gazette that announced slave uh, trades when they would happen. And he published many pamphlets for the Quaker organization. After the Revolutionary War, he is going to be one of the people that pushed to end the slave trade, and that finally happens after his death. But he is, is encouraging Congress at this time. One of the things that really changed his view and that he pushed for was education for black children. Dr. Bray had a schools in Philadelphia trying to educate free black children because at that time, of course, it was against the law to teach slaves to read and write. Dr. Bray invited him to visit the school and he was amazed. He came back with a whole new idea about the ability of these black children and he published many articles about it and even wrote address Congress about it. And the thing that he said was after watching these children who are given the opportunity to learn, I find that their comprehension and ability to, to gain new information and to uh, understand and absorb knowledge is as great as any race. The only thing that has stood in their way has been the lack of opportunity to learn. And so he begins to support the school financially and publicly in his speeches. 
1787, he becomes president of the Philadelphia Abolition Society, and he begins to work at that point to understanding that just ending the trade is not going to end slavery. There has got to be a comprehensive plan through Congress that develops uh, the end of slavery over a period of time. And uh, he writes a, a very well-drafted petition to Congress trying to get them to develop this plan. And this is three months before his death. Now, at that time, of course, the South is so in control of the Congress and they're all slave states that that never gets out of committee. It goes nowhere, but he does make that attempt. So like many men it, uh, during his lifetime, he understands that that institution must be ended. Sarah is going to go on to marry and have eight children. She is going to remain in the mansion with her family after her mother's death. And when he comes back from Europe, she is going to take care of him. He's going to die surrounded by his family at the age of 84, which at that time period is definitely an elderly statesman. Interestingly enough, all 35 religious leaders in Philadelphia joined to march in his funeral procession. He has supported every religious organization in Philadelphia. He believes that the religious organizations are necessary for a civil society, and he believes they should be encouraged in any way possible. One of the things that I found most interesting, in his, the codicil to his will, Ben Franklin wanted to establish trust in Boston and Philadelphia that would prove the benefit of compound interest. He left each city a thousand pounds British sterling to set up funds to finance these loans at 5% annum. They had to be young married artificers who had finished an apprenticeship. Now that's going to have to change because as it develops, the apprenticeships disappear, so they can't do that. After a hundred years, each of the cities could decide what they wanted to do with three quarters of the trust, or about three quarters. They could do it on any public project. And both of them chose to develop institutes of technology of learning, uh, Ben Franklin Institute in Boston and the Philadelphia Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. After the second hundred years, they could put whatever money is left into the public trust. In 1990, Boston had five million dollars in that trust and they put all five million into funding the Franklin Institute of Technology which still contributes to research and education. Philadelphia didn't do quite as well with their interests. They only have 2.3 million but they choose to divide it between the, the Franklin Institute, community libraries, and the fire companies and Philadelphia Academias, which is a fund to fund volunteer uh, vocational scholarships. Now, the thing about this is that money is still being invested in education in Philadelphia. In 2001, the West Philadelphia High School's biodiesel vehicle won the Tour de Soul Power of Dreams Award. Those young people had used a grant of $4,300 from the Franklin Trust. Don't you know he would be thrilled if he knew that people were still benefiting from his contributions to his community? I hope I've touched on some things that you didn't know about, Ben, and I hope that you have a little bit of admiration for that young boy, the 15th of 17 children, that became so important to the growth of our nation. Thank you. Wasn't that a fabulous presentation? Uh, if you didn't know how accomplished Benjamin Franklin was before this presentation, you know what an accomplished American he was now that you've heard Mary Robertson talk about him. Next week, one of our favorite reviewers, Sharon Lucky, is going to bring you uh, the story of Pat Conroy, one of America's uh, modern, uh, most admired authors. And so, uh, Sharon Lucky and Pat Conroy look forward to that next week.